we're all learning and there's absolutely no shame in saying, I need to uh, get better. I would love to learn from you. I respect what you do. Uh, would you give me that chance? And you'll be surprised at how many people would, would like to give you a chance. But you also want to go after things that are in the sphere of your competences. Try to convince the, the person on the other end that you have done your homework, that this institution, whatever it is, is important to you, uh, that you know it already, and that you would like to know it even more. Hey there, welcome to the Conductor's Podcast. I'm your host, Chao Wen Ting, a conductor with over 20 years of experience working with professional symphony orchestras, opera houses, new music groups, and vocalists. I'm also founder of Girls Who Conduct and have mentored hundreds of conductors from across the globe. I created the Conductor's Podcast to share all the behind the scenes secrets with you while I interview conductors, musicians, and business gurus from around the world. This is a space created for conductors, conducting students, musicians, and non-musicians who are curious and interested in learning more about the profession, craft, industry, and business. Shy away from the real talk? <laughs> no way. Money, hardship, growth, and the roller coaster of a conducting career are all topics we discuss here. I will give you simple, actionable, step-by-step -step strategies to help you take action on your big dream, move through the fear that's holding you back, and have a real impact. Now, pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. Hi there, and happy January! Welcome to another episode of the Conductor's Podcast. I'm your host, Chao Wenting, and I'm thrilled that you're tuning in with me today. How is your 2022 so far? I hope you are still fresh and energized and are ready to take on new or old and overdue projects. Today's episode is one that I'm personally really excited about as my guest today, Elizabeth Askren, was on my guest list way before I started this podcast. Elizabeth and I met when we were both fellows for the Dallas Opera Heart Institute for Women Conductors, and she has since continued to mentor other conductors and artists through the Dallas program and also the Transylvania Opera Academy that she founded in Cluj, Romania. In today's episode, Elizabeth will speak with me on one topic that I found really important and somehow underexplored during conservatory training, networking tips. If networking doesn't come as natural to you, or if you're always awkward speaking to strangers like me, today's episode is for you. Elizabeth Askren has built a fast-rising career by empowering musicians around the world, whether from the podium as a conductor of leading ensembles, as an educator with her Transylvania Opera Academy, and as a speaker on issues of leadership, diversity, and more. Her recent performances include debuts in Europe with the Transylvania State Philharmonic, the Romania National Opera of Cluj Napoca, and France's Victor Hugo Fonse Conte Orchestra. And in the United States with the Dallas Opera and Kentucky Opera. She has also performed with the London Symphony Orchestra and Royal Philharmonic Orchestra on recent recording projects. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth. I'm so thrilled to welcome you to today's episode, and I can't wait for you to share your story and experience with my audience. Thank you. Well, I'm really happy to be here with you, and thank you so much for having me. Hi, everybody. So before we get started, though, will you please give everybody a brief intro, just a little bit about your background and how you get to where you are right now? Sure. Well, uh, I am a native New Yorker, and uh, I love music like all the time. I went to um, Juilliard pre-college. I started when I was 14 there. And then from there, I went to Oberlin uh, Conservatory. And then I got um, a scholarship to continue my studies in Paris. 
but that was back in 1998 and it was supposed to be for one year and I still live in Europe. So <laughs> that was kind of a, a I guess, a life-changing experience because I really loved um, Europe. And so from then on, I've been living in Paris for many years. And then about eight years ago, um, we made the transfer to Transylvania uh, in Romania. And so now I've been doing this little triangle between Transylvania and um, Paris and France and then the United States. Uh, and I am a conductor and an educator and uh, like my hostess herself, a culturepreneur. So someone who likes to be entrepreneurial in the cultural sector. That is great. Can you tell us a little bit more about your scholarship, your opportunity to go to Paris? Because like at least where I grew up, we had the mindset, if you're serious about studying music, you go to Vienna. And how did that happen? And how was that experience that made you stay there in Europe for so many years now? Sure. Well, I went to Paris because I met Italian professors in Austria. Ta -da! So, <laughs> so I went to the Salzburg Mozarteum Summer Academy. And while I was there as a pianist, I had a great duo of um, Italian teachers. So the master teacher was Sergio Perticoroli and his associate teacher was Germain Trocatillon. And uh, during the year, they both taught in Paris at the Scuola Cantorum and uh, Maestro Perticarulli would come up from Rome where he was normally studying throughout the, I mean, teaching throughout the year at the uh, Academy, Santa Cecilia. And uh, Germain Tocatlian had her own studio in, uh, at the Scuola. And this duo was so wonderful in so many ways that I said, okay, I, I've got to keep studying with them. So when I finished my undergrad, um, I was looking for ways to make it over to Paris and so that I could keep studying with these wonderful musicians. And I ended up uh, finding the scholarship that's very important and still active today. So anybody who wants to go to Paris, check it out. It's from the Fondation des États-Unis. So it's the United States Foundation in Paris's 14th arrondissement. It's part of an international community called the Cité uh, Internationale Universitaire de Paris. And it, it um, brings together students and postdocs and grad students from all walks of life, um, from all over the globe, and gives them an international campus where we can all um, live together and study and, um, and have a wonderful experience as a young uh, a student um, in, in Paris. So the, the scholarship from the Fondation des États-Unis is called the Harriet Hale Woolley Scholarship. And... I, uh, I applied for it and it changed my life because uh, once I got it, then I knew I was off to Paris. Uh, I had a panic attack in the plane going over because I just, I felt like I was like, you know, Magellan just sailing off of the flat, you know, world or something like what's going to happen on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. But, um, but uh, it was wonderful. I had a great friend who picked me up from the airport and already I was very at home uh, in the Fondation. And I think what I've, I have loved about being in uh, Europe and living here has been the proximity of so many different cultures and languages and mentalities that are so easily accessible. Uh, I love that in two hours you can be in a completely different setting with, with completely different people and yet you're all part of the greater European community. That really appeals to me. Um, there are fundamental values that I believe in as well uh, and the sense of culture is very deep and rich here. So that those are probably some of the uh, grounding points that, that uh, made me stay here for so long. Yeah, I totally agree. I made up my mind to really pursuing the profession of conducting when I was doing the Erasmus program. I did one year in Netherlands and I was on scholarship from the Dutch government as well. So I was able to travel around. Um, but for anyone who is listening from the car or at the gym, don't worry, we will put a link of the scholarship program in the show note and you can always access it at chowenting.com forward slash 15. So Another question for you. So it sounds like you went to Paris to be a serious pianist. And when was that turning point that you decided conducting is something that is closer to your heart than playing piano at a keyboard? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I think mm, piano was my first love, but I knew I wanted to marry conducting. So I knew when I got bitten with the conducting bug, it was during my last moment at Juilliard where a very wonderful conductor who was on staff there, Rebecca Scott, gave me the opportunity to conduct the anthem, you know, the graduation anthem. And when I, when I got that kind of initial experience and it was so powerful for me and it, you know, it touched me very much, I thought, oh, this is interesting. And when I went to, uh, to uh, Oberlin, uh, I started studying more seriously. And I knew that that was kind of my future, um, even though I was much more advanced as a pianist, obviously, than as a, at, at the time I was a baby conductor. Um, so I think that while I was going to Paris, I already asked my piano teachers, where could I study conducting at the same time? So when I went over, I did win the scholarship as a pianist and to study with my maestri at the, at the Schola Cantorum. But I also, um, was accepted at the Ecole Normale de Musique as a conducting student of Dominique Huitz. So I already knew going there that this is what I really wanted to develop going forward. Um, and I was able to study both of them, um, both the piano and conducting there for, for a couple of years before I really made the conversion full time into conducting. So it sounds like you had that awakening moment at a young age. And did you have any objections from yourself or from other people? Did it matter to you if you had role models or like seeing really successful women conductors mm. at the top? Was, did you even think about those things? You know, I have to say in college, I really didn't. I mean, all of my conducting professors were men. Uh, I didn't think about that one way or the other. I don't even remember uh, the other um, classmates, if they were women or men. Um, it's funny. Yeah, at Oberlin, you know, it just wasn't wasn't an issue. Um, even in my class at École Normale de Musique, we had men and women. We had people from Asia, people from Europe, people. I think I was the only American there. But uh, that also was not an issue. It was just an issue to see how effective the conductors were. So that was refreshing. As I got into the, let's say, professional sphere and I started making some rounds as an assistant conductor, that's when it, I started getting remarks that were, you know, um, just ill-informed. You know, people thought I was always the personal assistant of the conductor. I couldn't be the, you know, the, the musical, right, conducting assistant. Um, but, uh, but during my years of training, even when I went back to Bard, um, cause I did a, an accelerated master's there with uh, Harold Farberman, um, that, that was never a question either. And there was no, um, kind of different way to treat women. I think we were 50, 50 as a, if I remember correctly, I think we were seven in the class and there were like four guys and three girls or something like that. Uh, so yeah, interestingly enough, that did not come into play during my formation. Yeah, I'm asking this question because I know that you were on the jury for the Maestra competition last year, which is an international competition for women conductors held jointly by the Philharmonie de Bahi and um, the Paris Mozart Orchestra. Could you talk about your experience kind of serving on the jury and seeing all the women? And I know it was also controversial to have a woman only um, competition for conductors. How right. was that like? Yes. Well, I loved the experience. I uh, really felt that it was a historic moment uh, because this very competition was being um, staged in Paris, which I think is very important. Um, I think that Claire Gibault did a wonderful job. And of course, the, the team at uh, the Philharmonie de Paris um, absolutely wonderful with uh, Emmanuel André. Uh, they really took care to compose a jury, which was 50-50, um, and also uh, no ageism in the jury as well. I think the youngest member of the jury must have been in his late 20s and the oldest in his 70s. Uh, so I really loved that kind of um, mixture of, of different cultures, different ages, and different points of view and perspectives. 
Uh, Marin Alsop was a part of the jury as well. That was a, a great honor, of course, because she's been a, a mentor, someone that we all look up to um, tremendously. And, um, and I also appreciated that all the members of the jury truly were concerned about watching these wonderful talents on the podium and uh, listening to them, you know, with their eyes, with their ears, uh, and trying to discern really fine criteria of who has the best technique, who is the most profound musician, who is the most developed, um, who can benefit from the first prize of not only having a monetary uh, compensation, but also to get in front of professional orchestras and lead them from the first rehearsal to a final concert. Um, and, I, and I think it was a, it was a, um, a journey for all of the members of the jury, which was very seriously undertaken. Uh, and I was, I was honored to be a part of that particular jury for those reasons. So here comes the best part of the interview, and I'm personally so looking forward to this because I know the topic we are discussing today is networking, which mm. is something that could be very intimidating and or it doesn't come as natural to some people than the others. And But we understand that a lot of the opportunities comes from who you know and also being at the right place at the right time. So can you please share some tips with us that would possibly break the ice more smoothly for example yes practice makes perfect i remember standing outside oh goodness it was in zurich i had taken the train to zurich to watch the tone Halle orchestra and um oh my goodness it was david zinman i think it was who was guest there and i wanted to meet him he was a fellow ob he went to oberlin and uh, I just wanted to, um, you know, speak with him and watch his rehearsals and so on. And I remember waiting outside his uh, his door for what seemed hours, and just being like, "Oh my gosh, what am I doing here? Will he ever talk to me? Will he even understand? You know, give me the time of day, anything like that." So, and I did that quite a lot in in the different circumstances. I wrote to all the Paris halls when I was a student and I said, I'm a young student, I'm at this conservatory, I showed them my papers because you had to do that. You couldn't just go into rehearsals like that. And it wasn't even to meet the conductors per se, it was just, I need to watch world-class conductors uh, working actively in real time with world-class orchestras. How, do, how does the conductor work with the orchestra? And I, I took notes, you know, and I tried to kind of feed my my young conductor brain uh, with with this kind of stuff. So I think the first thing is just get outside your comfort zone. Don't be afraid to ask, and don't be afraid to you know search out new opportunities, even if they don't exist. As I said in Paris, it was extremely rare for young uh, musicians to uh, to to actually sit in on rehearsals. They were closed, you know. Uh, but the fact that I actually dared to ask meant that a couple of the doors did open. Um, I got my first appointments, if you can say it like that, as, as a, an assistant conductor in Paris the same way. Those positions didn't exist. But I went up to the music director and, and I introduced myself at, good morning, sir. My name is so-and-so. I'm at this conservatory. This is my CV. I'm looking for opportunities. Would you, you know, need a conducting assistant? Who doesn't need a conducting assistant, right? So I think you, you know, don't be afraid. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? They can say, no, I don't, goodbye. And then you haven't lost anything and at least you can cross it off your list, right? So I think that's another thing is um, kind of dare, you know, we're, we're all learning and there's absolutely no shame in saying, I need to uh, get better. I would love to learn from you. I respect what you do. Uh, would you give me that chance? And you'll be surprised at how many people would, would like to give you a chance and who are open to that. So did you just send cold emails or did you want, did you need to find like a common teacher who knows someone or like when you reach out to orchestras or to ensembles, who do you know who to ask? Like, how do you know who to ask, like the manager or the maestro and that yeah. kind of thing? 
All great questions. Um, let's say, uh, let's go down the list, right? So if you have a shared connection, that's always better. I mean, if you can say that so-and-so has sent me or I'm, I'm calling you on behalf of so-and-so, uh, that's, that's always preferable. Uh, but, you know, even cold calling can can work sometimes, especially when you go out for these competitions. Now, I know that it is very disheartening that, you know, we all have sent how many, you know, dossiers and you take such care to send these dossiers out, whether they're for uh, jobs or they're for competitions or programs, young artist programs or whatever it is. And the amount of rejections is just oh, crushing sometimes. And you think, my gosh, I'm just wasting my time. But you're actually not. Remember in sales, 10% is the goal that you're striving for. If you can hit 10% acceptance rate, that's extraordinary. So, you know, with that 10% gets 90% of rejections. Uh, and so that's what you have to kind of keep in mind. But you also want to go after things that are in the sphere of your competences. So you also want to um, select the opportunities that you're going for, uh, which actually kind of make sense or are more tailored to you. For example, it, let's say you want to go out for a, an assistantship at a, an opera house. Uh, if you know no foreign languages and you don't play the piano, chances are that opportunity might not be suited to your profile. Whereas if you are a violinist and you played in a youth string orchestra that was nationally you know, acclaimed, um, and you would also want to apply for an assistant conductor position with a string orchestra or music director of a string youth ensemble or something like that, um, that's a much better fit. So you can also uh, pick and choose and try to tailor where you spend your efforts when you're trying to get that next opportunity for yourself. And another thing is that if you, let's say you cold call or cold contact somebody, you should have a reason. You should have, you should show them that you've done your research. It's not just, I'm sending the same email out to 50 <laughs> different places and it is not personalized at all. And I don't show them at all. Uh, in my initial email that I've done any research and I'm, I, I don't even know who I'm writing to actually. I just changed the email address. Um, so that that's a bad idea. Uh, so whenever you are cold calling, try to convince the the person on the other end that you have done your homework, that this institution, whatever it is, is important to you, uh, that you know it already and that you would like to know it even more. And that will that will help in some cases uh, also from looking at, you know, at this point, thousands of different dossiers for grants and scholarships and competitions and whatnot. Uh, how you present yourself is very important. Now, you don't need to have the latest website and spend a ton of money, but you do have to show the committee or whoever is receiving your materials that you care uh, and that you're not a sloppy or haphazard, you know, person. Um, cross your T's, dot your I's, spell correctly, you know, spell the the, the person's name correctly. Um, I've I've actually seen candidates, you know, and some of them would misspell my name. And, I, and when I was in charge of the Harriet Hale Woolley Scholarship later on, when I when I worked at the Fondation des États-Unis. Uh, and that's never good. I mean, you you pass on the dossier anyway, but that it it doesn't speak well for the person who's you know submitting the material. So do take care with that. Also, full sentences. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, we are not doing an SMS. We are composing a formal email. It's a different style. Um, all of these little things, and you know, uh, there's a difference in the details. And I think if if you see that someone is um, is going to take the care and time to present a, a well-crafted package, then chances are they're going to take the same kind of care in the work that they do and in their collaborations. Totally. It's really important to think about we don't want a careless person, as you say, it, or someone who doesn't seem to show respect or it doesn't seem to care about others' work. And if you have missed it, I shared some tips of writing cover letters in episode five. Right. And one of them was just exactly like 
like Elizabeth said, you really need to research and study that organization very well and speak mm -hmm. to them instead of just talking about yourself. And if you want to check that out, it's at chowenting.com forward slash five. I know like cover letter for applying for a position is a little different from kind of hoping to connect with someone for the first time when you send a cold email. So for example, if a young student coming to the Paris Conservatory to study con conducting for the first time and wanting to say, observe um, Claire's rehearsal with the Mozart Paris Orchestra, how would you kind of craft the kind of if you can give some concrete examples of what mm -hmm. would be a well-researched email that would put yourself well how do you really stand out from as you say so many applications and dossiers and and mm -hmm. to really still be authentic but yeah. speak to what is important uh, i think the first thing is to be authentic you know, I think uh, whether you're trying to be uh, an authentic artist or an authentic colleague or person, uh, this honesty and speaking from the heart is very important. And whoever it is that you are, some people are extraordinary extroverts. I mean, they are just going a mile a minute and they, you know, the, the party is always over there. Some people are extremely introverted. Uh, and they they speak very little, they speak very softly, or maybe they're in their thoughts. Whatever you personality you are, I think you want to embrace that and be the best version of you, not not a poorer version of somebody else, you know. Um, so I think that's very important in in whatever you're you're trying to do. Uh, and I think in all of these really valuable you know tips and tricks that you're talking about that you you've talked about on previous um, casts and so on, uh, the idea is to become the best iteration of yourself, you know, not to be a cookie cutter and to use these catchphrases and so on. So as you're saying, uh, you don't want to say, I want to study with the maestra or, you know, the, the organization is so great because that's not personalized and that does not bespeak a journey that you have made uh, to search out this particular person with this particular institution. Maybe you know that this particular maestro, uh, I, I'm going to talk about Janusz Fierst, who was one of my uh, mentors back in the day, uh, the fact that he was Hungarian um, and that he had already done work in Romania um, and, and with this particular violinist, um, I might I might say that really moved me uh, because I I studied with that violinist you know chamber music partner and and the sense of musicality was so deep and I really feel this connection and this is why I would love to come to you and to to continue in this deep musical tradition or with the Paris Mozart Orchestra um, I have already heard your concerts that you gave on Arte and I was at Nantes when you gave this live concert and I couldn't come and see you because of COVID restrictions, but I really wanted to celebrate what you do. It's so uh, alive. You know, really show that you, uh, that they mean something to you, something special, that you've actually been there, that you've actually done your research online and that you can say something that is true. Uh, and that is meaningful and why you would like to connect on a personal, um, more personal level. So it's like applying to colleges. I mean, I think we remember this moment where we apply to colleges. You don't apply to 20, you know, you just can't. So you, you have your number one choice. You have your number two choice. Maybe you have a number three and a safety. And you do your research and you really, you have your, your reasons for the number one you know, uh, and you take it very seriously. These takes these take months, really, of research and crafting of the personal essay and the this. It's kind of the same thing when you're courting orchestras or music directors or, you know, whoever is doing the hiring or these competitions. Uh, it's, it's not just, my approach is, it's not just throw a bunch of seeds down on the ground and see which of them grow. Um, it really is, tailoring your cover letters to people whom you think you can have a, a connection with. There's a, there's a reason, there's a raison d'etre 
that you are contacting them and not somebody else. So kind of a different question about contacting people. If you were at a conference and or at a symposium, sometimes people exchange、um, name cards.、Um, you might have spoken with someone who is、uh, staff with an opera house here, or a representative from a publisher here. So you collected a lot of the business cards. What do you do? Do you send an email just to say hi because you might not have an immediate purpose with this person, but then? That's kind of something that I've, I've always wanted. I would I would probably send a follow up email, say, "Hey, we met, and this is me." And after that, I don't know how to follow up, or like in two、yes. months, or in, I guess、um, I hate for that potential connection to go away. But I don't want to send something that is not purposeful or not nicely crafted. Absolutely, I, I think that's another. It falls in the nicely crafted basket, which is.、Uh, So you have met the person.、Um, you have exchanged business cards. You come home. What do you do with the business cards? The answer is do not throw it in the trash.、Uh, the answer is craft a nice. It was so nice to meet you. I really enjoyed our conversation about X. Because remember, this person might have had twenty conversations, and they might not remember your name, but they might have remembered the interesting conversation you had. So you might want to rem- remind the other person what you spoke about,、um, and then and then some kind of ask. You know, this is the formula. Either I would love for us to stay in touch. I'll be coming through Georgia next month and would love to take you out for coffee, or、um, you know, my new symphony is is being published at the end of the year, and I would love to send you. Whatever you know, something that doesn't stop、uh, this this initial exchange that you have brought about by by meeting this person to encourage the conversation to continue, and maybe that other you know it's like a dance. If one person has an ask and the other person has a need, and those are complementary. That's very fertile ground for something fun to happen, right? A new, a new adventure, a new collaboration.、Uh, if someone has an ask and the other person has no opportunities, they're not looking for anything. Then chances are it's not going to go very far. Or、uh, at the best, you might just have a nice colleague who will be interested in what you're doing, but there might not be a collaboration. In any case, that's okay. Don't take it personally.、Um, Some people are very busy. Not all people are really great at answering emails. Sometimes they might go and spam. You don't know. So I would say always give people the benefit of the doubt. You know,、um, be on an even keel about it. If some of the, some of them work out, that's wonderful. If others of them don't, don't worry about it. If you see the person again at another conference and you're don't don't say, oh god, they didn't get back to me. They hate me. No, don't worry about it. Just go up to them and say, "Well, hi. It's nice to see you. You know, how have you been since last time?" And just keep it keep it easy, because you know, as you know, everybody is so busy. We're all wearing so many hats. We're all doing so many things. I'm sure we do not spend our time saying, "How could we make other people feel bad by not answering their emails?" No, not at all, right? So just keep it easy and and、uh, and don't. Um, you know, don't worry about putting them on an email list. Also, you know, you could ask them. I'd love to keep you in touch with some of my things.、Uh, would you mind if I put you on our occasional mailing list of of my group and and let you know about what we're doing? Something like that. You could also try.、Um, and it's just a chance to make connections and to see if there is something a, a terrain that's fertile to be developed, or if it was just a nice encounter. And I'll be looking forward to seeing you at some other event. Yeah, and I want to emphasize that I know this can be very frustrating at times or disheartening because you're putting hours and hours of time and energy to research. This organization or this person, and you spend hours writing a nicely crafted email, and you might not get any response. And we all have been there, and it's totally normal. I hate to say this, 
Indeed, indeed. I mean, and that's that's part of the success. I mean, I remember reading the story a long, long time about, ago about, I think it was a composer who uh, won a very important award and she was going up to receive it and she could give a little speech and she said, you have no idea how hard it has been to arrive at this point. Uh, if you only knew, you know, how hard it has been. And I found that so refreshing because so many times you see these people at the award ceremony and they look beautiful and they're just like, yes, this is natural. I'm such a genius. And it was so easy for me, you know, and this person acknowledging that the, the road was so tough and, you know, you can get disheartened so many times. I think that's, that's part of it. I mean, this is a marathon, you know, your life is a marathon. It's not a sprint. So don't um, wind yourself prematurely. Uh, and, and don't, don't forget also to have fun along the way. You can't take any of this too, too seriously at the end of the day, because the, life is long, you know? Uh, and so if one person doesn't answer a letter, someone else will. Um, also, I think another uh, interesting point is that if you get a whole bunch of rejections, let's say you have a campaign. And, and you're sending your stuff out and you're getting rejections or no, no information at all, like no response. You might want to ask yourself, what am I doing wrong? You know, uh, if I'm getting like 0% interest, uh, is, it, is it my materials? Is it uh, my project that I'm proposing? Is it my target audience? Do I understand my target audience? Um, it's not always I put myself uh you know in my package and then i put it out there you have to tailor what you're asking to the people you're asking and that will change um you know you won't present yourself the same in academia the way that you'll present yourself to uh, performer and and performance venues um there are different aspects of your persona that you will put in front or maybe take to the second plan and you should be constantly changing and shifting things in order to make it make yourself more readable and understandable to your target audience. So I think that's another thing too, uh, you know. Yeah, definitely. And I had a question about that because I think a lot of people would really have sensed maybe there's something wrong about the materials or the way things were presented. But I felt it's a little bit like when you work with ensembles, some of them didn't work that well and some of them worked poorly, but you don't always get feedback. It's like when you send an email, you don't get a response. You have no way of knowing what went wrong or what was not good enough. If you sense there might be something needing improvement, put it this way, what are some ways that you can kind of audit for yourself to get better? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And that's something actually that we talk about in um, the Opera Academy that I founded in Romania, which is the Transylvanian Opera Academy. Uh, and one of the exercises that we do with incoming young musicians in the program is that we do exercises on self-analysis. Because I think one of the greatest gifts that you can give yourself is to develop an unbiased and clear ability to assess yourself uh, as an artist, as a professional um, going forward, because you should have a little coterie of maybe two or three people whose opinion, but not more, whose opinions you sincerely trust and value. And you could, you could ask one of them if they come to your concert, okay, what did you think? Um, you know, if you have two or three, that is wonderful and you're very lucky. Uh, you know, but otherwise you're largely, as you say, left to yourself. You're not going to get that feedback, you know? And so if you don't know how to analyze yourself and how to, um, really be honest with yourself, it's hard sometimes, you know, it's hard, uh, to say, you know what, when I give interviews, I'm not very interesting. I just realized that I recorded myself and I sound like a drone or, you know, I don't know. Um, you know, I've, I've seen my rehearsal footage. I'm so boring. I say, um, all the time and I have to work on this, you know, um, it, it might, 
it, it might not make an, a difference right there and then, but in any case, you are always in progression. You are always in movement and momentum as a professional, as an artist. And so if you can see yourself in good, or you can say, gosh, that comment, that was spot on. I'm really proud of that moment, you know, that I, that I was able to pinpoint that problem or I got the, the orchestra to sound so sweet there. That's amazing. If you can, if you can do that and know yourself, right, uh, then you will have, I think, more fulfilling experiences going forward and you can learn more from the mistakes and, and the, the things that didn't work out. You can use them to your advantage. And so to become, again, the more true version of yourself. It, it's so wonderful that you talked about self-analysis because also as conductors, that's something we need to be constantly doing. You, mm -hmm. are the, you should be the best judge of yourself because when you're out of school, you're on your own mm -hmm. and you are to analyze yourself what went well, what didn't went well, what didn't go well with a particular rehearsal, with a particular engagement. If you make mistakes in programming, maybe you shouldn't have programmed this piece instead of the other one and all that. But the self-analysis that you were talking about that you teach at the academy, is that a, like a step or like a checklist? Is that something that you can share with the audience? If not, it's yeah. totally okay. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Um, you know, it's it's both like a short uh, series of short term exercises and then a longer term. For example, a lot of students are taught, especially in more traditional settings, that whatever the teacher says must be right, right? And I have to listen to whatever the teacher says uh, because I'm here to learn from the teacher. And then when I come out, I will have the print, you know, of the teacher and. I mean, listen, even at Juilliard, you could hear who came out of what studio, right? Or, you know, at Oberlin, you could you could tell a Schwartz student from a Takash student from a, you know, Margolis student. Um, so I'm not saying necessarily that that's a bad thing or that you should not listen to your teachers. But what that does not encourage, that that's an initial step where you're learning your craft. You're learning um, even, even the master painters in Paris uh, when they're in the Ecole Nationale de Beaux-Arts, they take courses on copying the masters. Why? Because in copying the masters, they assimilate the master's techniques and strengths. And they, they appropriate this coterie of skills uh, and, and outlooks and artistry that they can then, then that's step number two, appropriate for themselves and make it personal so that you're no longer a copy of the master or the teacher, you become your own version and, and that you've had very important and um, reasoned and, and uh, prestigious, let's say, but for the right reasons, influences on you. And that's why I think it's so important to find the right mentors and the right teachers when you are developing, because in any case, you are going to absorb like a sponge, whoever is teaching you. And if you have someone who is not very enlightened, uh, then you will come out with not, not the greatest, you know, um, uh, education or, or, you know, you, you won't be pushed in the same way and challenged in the same way. As someone who is really passionate about what they're doing, they have a great musical pedigree and they're teaching it and they're showing it to you in, in a very clear uh, way. So I think you wanna be an advocate for yourself as a young person and go for the best teachers or the best experiences that you can because that is a, an investment in your own development and that will serve you all the rest of your life. That will be your point de repère, your reference points going forward. Um, and then you have to challenge yourself once you're done in that initial stage uh, of, of uh, learning to ask yourself questions. I know that, for example, when, when uh, I was a young student at the Ecole Normale, we would videotape our sessions with the orchestra and then we would do the very painful uh, exercise of looking at our, you know, uh, rehearsals with the orchestra, sometimes with our teacher, sometimes with the assistant, but always with somebody. And that is so embarrassing 
because you see everything that's not right. And even in my master's program, we videoed all the lessons because we had all the things that our teacher would say to us that we, we would maybe forget if we can't write it down because we're in a lesson. Uh, and also you see how our body is transmitting everything, our tics as well as our musicality or, or a blockage somewhere. If there's a blockage between what you're thinking and what your arms are expressing, then you need to be aware of that. And sometimes you have to objectify yourself in order to see things clearly, because once you're in it, uh, you, you, you don't have that kind of perspective. So, um, so that's also what we encourage is uh, take those moments, record yourself, uh, and take those moments to look at yourself as if you would a third person. Not all the time, of course, from time to time, because you don't want to distance yourself completely from your artistic experience, of course. But uh, but those are some techniques I think that can that can be helpful. That is wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. So you talked about like finding a good teacher and really learn what the teacher can offer to you, both technically and musically and everything just like and the next step is you want to personalize what you have learned because you don't want to be just a copycat of your teacher mm -hmm. and if you're only a copycat why why do we want you we just want your teacher <laughs> but you have something about yourself your personality and how things will suit you better especially with conducting we have all different physicality mm -hmm. and different make of your body so one thing that works well for your teacher might not be working well or as natural with your own arm or your head and how you even how you stand yeah. and ask yourself questions review your materials with someone else um, at present that's that would be very terrifying for me very hard very hard <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you can you can have a buddy. Let's say that you're in a master's program. You have your buddy and say, okay, let's be video buddies, okay? And then we go out for a beer afterwards or something. You know, just kind of, uh, you know, you make it a little less scary. But uh, but it's it's very good. I mean, I remember my colleagues at Ecole Normale. They, I, I thought I was being very passionate. You know, I'm I, I don't know, I was like 22 or something. Very passionate, and they were like, why are you so angry? I'm like, oh okay, that's not what I want to transmit to people is anger. <laughs> like, you know, so you have to, yeah, these comments, if, if they're well meant, and they're, they're not meant to hurt, they're just meant to show you, I don't understand why you want to be so mad there. You know, then you can say, okay, well, what is that? Uh, and, and is that just me? Or is that something that's getting in the way of expressing what I truly feel? So you can have that dialogue with yourself as, as well with your trusted colleagues. Yeah, and I would say don't take it personally because it can be really hard to get that kind of comment. I mm -hmm. remember when I was starting, I often got the comments that I was very distanced. I was I almost like I didn't care while I was really trying to process what the teacher was telling me and make the intelligent decision while people say I didn't connect or didn't engage. Um and I was very puzzled and confused, like why? And but really just kind of as Elizabeth said, try to look at yourself as a third party. And over time you would get better at kind of reviewing yourself in that way. So Elizabeth, thank you so much for all you have shared. And please tell my listeners where they can find more about you or if they wanted to be in contact with you, what would be the best way if you're you're willing to share your Facebook or your website or anything? Sure. Well, I have a website and I think that's one stop shopping for finding out more and also dropping me a line. Uh, and it's very easy. It's just my name. Uh, so it's Elizabeth with a Z and then Askren, A-S-K-R-E-N.com. So uh, that's where you can find where I'm going to be performing or speaking or doing anything that's public. And, uh, and also you can drop me a line and um, yeah, I hope to see you either uh, over the waves or in person. And I hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. So here you have it. And I hope you love this chat as much as I do. As I said at the beginning of the show, 
Elizabeth was on my guest list even before I started this podcasting project. I knew that she would have a lot to offer and to share with all of us, and I loved every minute of the conversation. So, what's your biggest takeaway from the chat? I particularly loved that she shared about contacting someone for the first time with a cold email. You definitely don't want to send out a template message, but want to tailor the content to the addressee. Think about what we talked about cover letter tips in episode five. You want to do a lot of homework and to talk about them, not you. If you've missed that episode, you can always check out the show note at chaowenting dot com forward slash number five, and I will also link this to this episode's show notes, and you can find it at chaowenting dot com forward slash fifteen. As Elizabeth said, when contacting someone, you want to be very specific. Know what they are known for, their recent project, or even their expertise. And coming with just one particular request, don't just say that I admire the art maestro and want to learn from you. That won't work well or make a strong impression. For example, if you're contacting me for the first time and you would know from googling me that I'm passionate about promoting women composers and mentoring young conductors, so when you contact me, you could say something like. You like my programming choices and would like to know my experience working with composer X Y Z, whose work that I recently conducted or premiered. That kind of email would really hit home with me. You know, I have gotten a message from a composer once, who obviously knew nothing about me, and the first line of the message read. Hey, I don't know if you perform works by living composers, but I have a piece. Blah 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 blah. I immediately trashed that message and didn't even bother to respond, as I didn't feel respected. That was one extreme example, though, but something to really keep in mind as we get lots, lots of introductory emails every day, pitching ideas, collaboration project, soloists looking for an ensemble to work with, or composers introducing their new works, commission consortium, and so on. So. Do your homework and be very, very specific. What are some networking practices that have worked for you? Please share with me. And if you're listening from the car or at the train, you can find all information in the show note at chaowenting dot com forward slash number fifteen. You can also ask questions or share your thoughts with me, as I always love to hear from you. You can tag me on social media.、Um, I'm at Ting Chaowen on Instagram and Chaowen Ting Conductor on Facebook. If you post something, don't forget to use the hashtag The Conductors Podcast. My guest next week, Jennifer Kim, will be sharing with us how she started a new vocal ensemble amidst the pandemic, and how she found her niche to attract the right people for her project. I can't wait for you to hear that conversation, as it's full of tips. You all know that I love tangible step-by-step -step strategies, right? Okay, I will see you next week at the same time, same place. Bye for now.